Chapter 10 from American History by Alan Brinkley, Volume 1 to 1865, 14th edition. America's Economic Revolution. When the United States entered the War of 1812, it was still an essentially agri agrarian nation. There were, to be sure, cities in America, several of substantial size, and there was modest but growing manufacturing activity. But the overwhelming majority of Americans were farmers and tradespeople, and the economy was largely a local one. By the time the Civil War began in 1861, the United States had transformed itself. Most Americans were still rural people, but even most American farmers were now part of a national and increasingly international market economy. The United States had developed a major manufacturing sector and was beginning to challenge the industrial nations of Europe for supremacy. The nation had experienced the first stage of its industrial revolution. The dramatic changes that resulted from the Industrial Revolution affected the nation's economy, society, culture, and politics. But the changes did not have the same impact everywhere. The Northeast and the Northwest were rapidly developing a complex modern economy and society. Increasingly dominated by large cities, important manufacturing, and profit, profitable commercial farming. It was in many ways an unequal society, but it was also a fluid one, firmly committed to the idea of free labor. In the South and Southwest, there were changes too. Southern agriculture, particularly cotton farming, flourished as never before in response to the growing demand from textile mills in New England and elsewhere. But the South remained much less economically developed than the North, as the North became ever more committed to the fluidity and mobility of its free labor system. The South was becoming more and more resolute in its defense of slavery. The economic revolution was transforming the nation. It was also dividing it. Page 262. The Changing of American Population The American Industrial Revolution was a result of many factors. Before it could occur, the United States needed a population large enough both to grow its own food and to provide a surplus workforce for an industrial economy. It needed a transportation and communication system capable of sustaining commerce over a large geographic area. It needed the, technolog the technology to permit manufacturing on a large scale, and it needed systems of business organization capable of managing large industrial enterprises. By 1860, the northern regions of the nation had acquired at least the beginnings of all those things. The American Population, 1820 to 1840, page 262 through 263. Three trends characterized the American population between 1820 and 1840, all of them contributing in various ways to economic growth. The population was increasing Rapidly, much of it was moving from the countryside into the industrializing cities of the Northeast and Northwest, and much of it was migrating westward. The American population had stood at only 4 million in 1790. By 1820, it had reached 10 million. By 1830, nearly 13 million. And by 1840, 17 million. The United States was growing much more rapidly in population than Britain or Europe. One reason for this substantial population growth was improvements in public health. 
the number and ferocity of epidemics such as the great cholera plague of 1832, which had periodically decimated urban and even rural populations in America, slowly declined, as did the nation's mortality rate as a whole. The population increase was also a result of a high birth rate. In 1840, white women bore an average of 6.14 children each a decline each a decline from the very high rates of the 18th century but still substantial enough to produce rapid population increases particularly since a larger proportion of children could expect to grow to adulthood than had been the case in a generation or two earlier immigration choked off by the wars in europe and economic economic crisis in America contributed little to the American population in the first three deca decades of the 19th century, but rapidly revived beginning in the 1830s. Of the total 1830 population of nearly 13 million, the foreign born numbered fewer than 500,000, but the number of immigrants climbed by 60,000 in 1832 and nearly 80,000 in 1837. Reduced transportation costs and increasing economic opportunities helped stimulate the immigration boom, as did deteriorating economic conditions in some areas of Europe. The migrations introduced new groups to the United States in particular, the number of immigrants arriving from the southern counties of Ireland began to grow, marking the beginning of a tremendous influx of Irish Catholics that was to continue through the three decades before the Civil War. Much of this new European immigration flowed into the rapidly growing cities of the Northeast but urban growth was a result of substantial internal migration as well as the agricultural regions of New England and other areas grew less profitable. More and more people picked up stakes and moved, some to more promising agricultural regions in the West, but many to eastern cities. In 1790, one person in 30 had lived in a city defined as a community of 8,000 or more. In 1820, one in 20, and in 1840, one in 12. The rise of New York City was particularly dramatic by 1810. It was the largest city in the United States. That was partly a result of a superior natural harbor. It was also a result of the Erie Canal completed in 1825 which gave the city unrivaled access to the interior and of liberal state laws that made the city attractive for both foreign and domestic commerce. Immigration and Urban Growth, 1840 to 1860, page 263. <clears throat> the growth of cities accelerated even more dr dramatically between 1840 and 1860. The population of New York, for example, rose from 312,000 to 805,000. New York's population would have numbered 1.2 million in 1860 if Brooklyn, which was then a separate municipality, had been included in the total. Philadelphia's population grew over the same 20-year period from 20... 220,000 to 565,000. Boston's from 93,000 to 177,000. By 1860, 26% of the population of the free states was living in town, places of 2,500 people or more, or cities, 8,000 people or more, up from 14% in 1840. 
That percentage was even higher for the industrializing states of the Northeast. In the South, by contrast, the increase of urban residents was only from 6% in 1840 to 10% in 1860. The booming agricultural economy of the western regions of the nation produced significant urban growth as well. Between 1820 and 1840, communities that had once been small western villages or trading posts became major cities. St. Louis, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, Louisville, all of them benefited from strategic positions on the Mississippi River or one of its major tributaries. All of them became centers of the growing carrying trade that connected the farmers of the Midwest with New Orleans and through it, the cities of the Northeast. After 1830, however, substantial shipping began from the Mississippi River to the Great Lakes, creating major new urban centers that gradually superseded the river ports among them were Buffalo, Detroit, Milwaukee, Cleveland, and most important in the end, Chicago. The enlarged urban population was in part a reflection of the growth of the national population as a whole, which rose by more than a third, from 23 million to over 31 million in the decade of the 1850s alone. By 1860, the American population was larger than Britain's and quickly approaching that of France and Germany. Urban growth was also a result of increasing the increasing flow of people into cities from the farms of the Northeast. Immigration from abroad continued to increase as well. Between 1840 and 1850, more than 1. Fill 5 million Europeans moved to America, three times the number of arrivals in the 1830s. Still, greater numbers arrived in the 1850s, over 2.5 million, almost half the residents of New York City in the 1850s were recent immigrants. In St. Louis, Chicago, and Milwaukee, the foreign-born outnumbered those of native birth. Few immigrants settled in the South. Only 500,000 lived in the slave states. In 1860, and a third of these were concentrated in Missouri, mostly in St. Louis. <clears throat> the newcomers came from many different countries and regions. England, France, Italy, Scandinavia, Poland, and Holland. But the overwhelming majority came from Ireland and Germany. In 1850, the Irish constituted approximately 45% and the Germans over 20% of the foreign born in America. By 1860, there were more than 1.5 million Irish born and approximately 1 million German born people in the United States. In Germany, the economic dislocations of the Industrial Revolution had caused widespread poverty and the collapse of the Liberal Revolution there in 1848 also persuaded many Germans to emigrate. In Ireland, the oppressiveness and unpopularity of English rule drove many people out. But even more important was the greatest disaster in Ireland, Ireland's history, a catastrophic failure of the potato crop and other food crops that caused the devastating potato famine of 1845 18, to 1849. Nearly a million people died of star starvation and disease, well over a million more emigrated to the United States. <clears throat> the great majority of the Irish settled in eastern cities where they sw swelled the ranks of unskilled labor. Most Germans moved on to the Northwest where they became farmers 
or went into business in the western towns. One reason for the difference was wealth. German immigrants generally arrived with at least some money. The Irish had practically none. Another important reason was gender. Most German immigrants were members of family groups or, sing or were single men for whom <clears throat> movement to the agricultural frontier was both possible and attractive. Many Irish immigrants were young, single women for whom movement west was much less plausible. They were more likely to stay in the eastern cities where factory and domestic work was available. The Rise of Nativism, page 265, and then it picks back up again on 268. Some native-born Americans welcomed the new immigration, which provided a large supply of cheap labor that they believed would help keep wage rates low. Land speculators and others with investments in the sparsely populated West hoped that immigrants would move into the region and help expand the population and thus the market for land and goods there. Political leaders in Western states and territories wanted the immigrants to swell their population also increased the political influence of the region. Wisconsin, for example, permitted foreign-born residents to become voters as soon as they had declared their intention of seeking citizenship and had resided in the state for a year. Other Western states soon followed its lead. In Eastern cities, two urban political organizations eagerly courted immigrant voters, hoping to enhance their own political strength. Other Americans, however, viewed the growing foreign-born population with alarm. Their fears led to the rise of what is known as nativism, a defense of native-born people and a hostility to the foreign-born, usually combined with a desire to stop or slow immigration. The emerging nativism took many forms. Some of it was a result of simple racism. Many nativists, conveniently overlooking their own immigrant heritage, argued that the new immigrants were inherently inferior to older stock Americans. Some viewed them <clears throat> with the same contempt and prejudice and the same low estimate of their potential abilities with which they viewed African Americans and Indians. Many nativists avoided racist arguments but argued never, ne nevertheless that the newcomers were socially unfit to live alongside people of older stock, that they did not bring with them sufficient standards of civilization. Evidence for that, they claimed, was the wretched urban and sometimes rural slums in which they lived. Many nativists seemed to assume that such wretchedness was something immigrants chose rather than the result of their extreme poverty. Others, especially workers, complained that because Foreigners were willing to work for low wages. They were stealing jobs from the native labor force. Protestants, observing the success of Irish Catholics in establish, establishing footholds in urban politics, warned that the Catholic Church and the Pope were gaining a foothold in American government. Whig politicians were outraged because so many of the newcomers voted Democratic. Others complained that the immigrants corrupted po politics by selling their votes. Many older stock Americans of both parties feared that immigrants would bring new radical ideas into national life. Out of these tensions and prejudices emerged a number of new secret societies created to combat what nativists had come 
to call the alien menace. Most of them originated in the Northeast. Some later spread to the West and even to the South. The first of these, the Native American Association, began agit agitating against immigration in 1837. In 1845, nativists held a convention in Philadelphia and formed the Native American Party. Unaware that the term they used to describe themselves would one day become a common label for American Indians. Many of the natives, nativists groups combined in 1850 to form the Supreme Order of the Star Spangled Banner. It endorsed a list of demands that included banning Catholics or the foreign born from holding public office more restrictive neutralization laws and literacy tests for voting. The order adopted a strict code of secrecy, which included the secret password used in lodges across the country. I know nothing. Ultimately, members of the movement became known as the Know Nothings. Gradually, the Know Nothings turned their attention to party politics, and after the election of 1852, they created a new political organization that they called the American Party. In the East, the new organization scored an immediate and astonishing success in the elections of 1854. The Know Nothings cast a large vote in Pennsylvania and New York and won control of the state government in Massachusetts. Elsewhere, the progress of the Know Nothings was more modest. Western members of the party, because of the presence of many German voters in the area, found it expedient not to oppose naturalized Protestants. After 1854, the strength of the Know Nothings declined. Transportation, Communications, and Technology, page 269. Just as the Industrial Revolution needed a growing population, it also required an efficient system of transportation and communications. Such a system was essential in creating regional, national, and ultimately international markets. Progress in this area required not just significant investment, but also important advances in te technological knowledge. The Canal Age, also page 269 to page 271. From 1790 until the 1820s, the so-called Turnpike Era Americans had relied largely on roads for internal transportation, but in a country as large as the United States was becoming, roads alone and the mostly horse-drawn vehicles that used them were not adequate for the nation's expanding needs. And so, in the 1820s and 1830s, Americans began to turn to other means of transportation as well. The larger rivers, especially the Mississippi and the Ohio, had been important transportation routes for years, but most of the traffic on them consisted of flat barges, little more than rafts that floated downstream laden with cargo and were broken up at the end of their journeys because they could not navigate back upstream. To return north, shippers had to send goods by land or by agonizingly slow upstream vessels that sometimes took up to four months to travel the length of the Mississippi. These rivers became vastly more important by the 1820s. As steamboats grew in numbers and improved in design, the new river boats carried the corn and wheat of Northwestern farmers and the cotton and tobacco of Southwestern planters to New Orleans in a fraction of the time of the old barges. From New Orleans, ocean-going ships took the cargoes on to eastern ports. Steamboats also developed a significant passenger traffic. 
and the companies built increasingly lavish vessels to compete for the lucrative trade. But neither the farmers or the West of the West nor the merchants of the East were wholly satisfied with the pattern of trade. Farmers would pay less to transport their goods and Eastern consumers would pay less to consume them if they could ship them directly eastward to market rather than by the roundabout river seeds route. And Northeastern merchants too could sell larger quantities of their manufactured goods. If they could transport their merchandise more directly and economically to the West, new highways across the mountains provided a partial solution to the problem. But the costs of hauling goods over land, although lower than before, were still too high for anything except the most compact and valuable merchandise. The thoughts of some merchants and entrepreneurs began, therefore, to turn to an alternative canals. A team of four horses could haul one and a half tons of goods 18 miles a day on the turnpikes. But the same four horses walking along the, the towpaths next to canals while yoked to barges could draw a boat load of 100 tons 24 miles a day. By the 1820s, <clears throat> the economic advantages of canals had generated a booming interest in, in expanding the water routes to the west. Canal building was too expensive for private e enterprise and the job of digging canals fell largely to the states. The ambitious state governments of the Northeast took the lead in constructing them. New York was the first to act. It had the natural advantage of a good land route between the Hudson River and Lake Erie through the only real break in the Appalachian chain. But the engineering tasks were still imposing. The distance was more than 350 miles, several times the length of any of the existing canals in America. The route was interrupted by high ridges and wilderness of woods. After a long public debate over whether the scheme was practical, canal advocates prevailed when DeWitt Clinton, a late but ardent convert to the cause, became governor in 1817. Digging began on July 4th, 1817. The building of the Erie Canal was the greatest construction project the United States had ever undertaken. The canal itself was simple, a ditch 40 feet wide and four feet deep with towpaths along the banks, but hundreds of difficult cuts and fills some of them enormous were required to enable the canal to pass through hills and other valleys. Stone aqueducts were necessary to carry it across the streams and 88 locks of heavy masonry with great wooden gates were needed to permit ascents and descents. The Erie Canal was not just an engineering triumph, but an immediate financial success as well. It opened in October, 1825. Amid elaborate ceremonies and celebrations and traffic was soon so heavy that within about seven years, tolls had repaid the entire cost of construction. By providing a route to the Great Lakes, the canal gave New York direct access to Chicago and the growing markets of the West. New York could now complete with, compete with and increasingly replace New Orleans as a destination for agricultural goods, particularly wheat and other products of the West and as a source for manufactured goods to be sold in the region. The system of water transportation and the primary of New York, uh, the, prim the primacy of New York extended farther than the states of Ohio and Indiana. 
inspired by the success of the Erie Canal, provided water connections between Lake Erie and the Ohio, Ohio River. These canals helped connect them by an inland water route all the way to New York, although it was still necessary to transfer cargo several times between canal, lake, and river craft. One of the immediate results of these new transportation routes was increased white settlement in the Northwest because canals made it easier for migrants to make the westward journey and to ship their goods back to Eastern markets. Rival cities along the Atlantic seaboard took alarm at the prospect of New York's acquiring so vast a hinterland, but they had limited success in catching up. Boston, its, its way to the Hudson River blocked by the Berkshire Mountains did not even try to connect itself to the west by canal. Its hinterland would remain confirmed largely to New England, Philadelphia, and Baltimore had the still more formidable Allegheny Mountains to contend with. They made a serious effort at canal building, nevertheless, but with discouraging results. Pennsylvania's effort ended in an expensive failure. Maryland constructed part of the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal beginning in 1828, but completed only the stretch between Washington, D.C. and Cumberland, Maryland, and thus never crossed the mountains. In the South, Richmond and Charleston also aspired to build water routes to the Ohio Valley, but <clears throat> never completed them. In the end, canals did not provide a satisfactory route to the West for any of the New York's rivals. Some cities, however, saw their opportunity in a different and newer means of transportation. Even before the canal age had reached its height, the era of the railroad was already beginning. The early railroads, page 271 and 272. Eventually, railroads became the primary transportation system for the United States, and they remained so until the construction of the interstate highway system in the mid 20th century. Railroads emerged from a combination of technological and entrepreneurial innovations. The technological breakthroughs included the invention of tracks, the creation of steam-powered locomotives, and the development of railroad cars that could serve as public carriers of passengers and freight. By 1804, both English and American inventors had experimented with steam engines for propelling land vehicles. In 1820, John Stevens ran a locomotive and cars around a circular track on his New Jersey estate. And in 1825, the Stockton and Darlington Railroad in England opened a short length of track and became the first line to carry general traffic. American entrepreneurs, especially in those northeastern cities that sought better communication with the West, quickly grew interested in the English experiment. The first company to begin actual operations was the Baltimore and Ohio, which opened a 13-mile stretch of track in 1830. In New York, the Mohawk and Hudson began running trains along the 16 miles between Schenectady and, or I'm sorry, Schenectady and Albany in 1831. By 1836, more than a thousand miles of track had been laid in 11 states. But there was not yet a true railroad system. Even the longest of the lines was comparatively short in the 1830s, and most of them served simply to connect water routes, not to link one railroad to another. Even when two lines did connect, the tracks often differed in gauge width, so that cars from one line often could not fit onto the tracks of another. Schedules were erratic and wrecks were frequent. 
but railroads made some important advances in the 1830s and 1840s. The introduction of heavier, heavier iron nails improved the roadbeds. Steam locomotives became more flexible and powerful. Redesigned passenger cars became stabler and more comfortable and larger. Railroads and canals were soon competing bitterly for a time. The Chesapeake and Ohio Canal Company blocked the advance of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad through the narrow gorge of the Upper Potomac, which it controlled, and the state of New York prohibited railroads from hauling freight in competition with the Erie Canal and its branches. But railroads had so many advantages that when they were able to complete to, to compete freely with other forms of trans transportation, they almost always prevailed. The Triumph of the Rails, page 172 and 173. After 1840, railroads gradually supplanted canals and all other modes of transport. In 1840, there were 2,818 miles of railroad tracks in the United States. By 1850, there were 9,021, an unparalleled burst of railroad construction followed in the 1850s, tripling the amount of trackage in just 10 years. The most comprehensive and efficient system was the Northeast, which had twice as much trackage per square mile as the Northwest, and four times as much as the South. But the expansion of the rails left no region untouched. Railroads were even reaching west of the Mississippi, which was spanned at several points by great iron bridges. One line ran from Hannibal to St. Joseph on the Missouri River, and another was under construction between St. Louis and Kansas City. An important change in railroad development was the trend toward the consolidation of short lines into longer lines, known as trunk lines. By 1853, four major railroad trunk lines had crossed the Appalachian Mountains to connect the north Northeast with the Northwest. The New York Central and the New York and Erie gave New York City access to the Lake Erie ports. The Pennsylvania Railroad linked Philadelphia and Pittsburgh and the Baltimore and Ohio connected Baltimore with the Ohio River at Wheeling. From the terminals of these lines, other railroads into the interior touched the Mississippi River at eight points. Chicago became the rail center of the West, served by 15 lines and more than 100 daily trains. The appearance of the great trunk lines tended to divert traffic from the main water routes, the Erie Canal and the Mississippi River. By lessening the, the dependence of the West on the Mississippi, the ro railroads helped weaken further the connection between the Northwest and the South. Capital to finance. The railroad boom came from many sources. Private American investor, investors provided part of the necessary funding, and railroad companies borrowed large sums from abroad. But local governments, states, counties, cities, towns also often contributed capital because they were eager to, eager to have railroads serve them. The railroads obtained a substantial additional assistance from the federal government in the form of public land grants. In 1850, Senator Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois and other railroad-minded politicians persuaded Congress to grant federal lands to aid the Illinois Central, which was building from Chicago toward the Gulf of Mexico. Other states and their railroad promoters demanded the same privileges, and by 1860, Congress had allotted over 30 million acres to 11 states to assist railroad construction. Innovations in Communications and Journalism, page 274. 
Critical to the railroads was an important innovation in communications. The magnetic telegraph, telegraph lines extended along the tracks connecting one station with another and aiding the scheduling and routing of trains. But the telegraph also permitted distant communication between distant cities, tying the nation together as never before. At the same time, it helped reinforce the schism between the North and the South. Like railroads, telegraph lines were far more extensive in the North than in the South, and they helped similarly to link the North to the Northwest and thus to separate the Northwest further from the South. The telegraph burst into American life in 1844 when Samuel F. B. Morse, after several years of experimentation, succeeded in transmitting from Baltimore to Washington the news of James K. Polk's nomination for the presidency. The relatively low cost of constructing wire systems made the Morse tele telegraph system seem the ideal answer to the problems of long distance communication. By 1860, more than 50,000 miles of wire connected most parts of the country and a year later, the Pacific Telegraph with 3,595 miles of wire opened between New York and San Francisco. By then, nearly all the independent lines had joined in one organization, the Western Union Telegraph Company. New forms of journalism also drew communities into a common communication system. In 1846, Richard Ho invented the steam cylinder rotary press, making it possible to print newspapers rapidly and cheaply. The development of the telegraph, together with the intro introduction of the rotary press, made possible much speedier collection and distribution of news than ever before. In 1846, newspaper publishers from around the nation formed the Associated Press to promote cooperative news gathering by wire. No longer did they have to, de to depend on cumbersome exchanges of newspapers for out-of-town reports. Major metropolitan newspapers began to appear in larger cities of the Northeast. In New York alone, there were Horace Greeley's Tribune, James Jordan's uh, Bennett's Herald, Henry J. Raymond's Times, and others, all gave serious attention to national and even international events and had substantial circulations beyond the city. In the long run, journalism would become an important unifying factor in American life. In the 1840s and 1850s, however, the rise of the new journalism helped to feed sectional discord. Most of the major magazines and newspapers were in the North, reinforcing the South's sense of subjugation. Southern newspapers tended to have smaller budgets and reported largely local news. Few had any impact outside their immediate communities. The combined circulation of the Tribune and the Herald exceeded that of all the daily newspapers published in the South put together. Commerce and Industry, page 274. By the middle years of the 19th century, the United States had developed the beginning of a modern capitalist economy and an advanced industrial capacity. This emerging economy created enormous wealth and changed the face of all areas of the nation, but it did not, of course, affect everyone equally. Some classes and regions benefited from the economic development far more than others. The expansion of business 1820 to 1840 Pages 274 and 275. American business grew rapidly in the 1820s and 1830s, partly because of population growth and the transportation revolution, but also because of the daring imagination and ruthlessness of a new generation of entrepreneurs. 
one important change came in the retail distribution of goods. In the larger cities, stores specializing in groceries, dry goods, hardware, and other lines appeared, although residents of smaller towns and villages still depended on general stores, stores that did not specialize. In these less populous areas, many people did much of their business by barter. The organization of business was also changing. Individuals or limited partnerships continued to operate most businesses and the dominating figures were still the great merchant capitalists who generally had sole ownership of their enterprises. In some larger businesses, however, the individual merchant capitalist was giving way to the corporation. Corporations began to develop particularly rapidly in the 1830s when some legal obstacles to their formation were removed. Previously, a co corporation could obtain a charter only by a special act of the state legislature, a cumbersome process that stifled corporate growth. By the 1830s, however, states were beginning to pass general incorporation laws that under which a group could secure a charter merely by paying a fee. The new laws also permitted a system of limited liability, which meant that individual stockholders risked losing only the value of their own investment if a corporation should fail and that they were not liable, as they had been in the past. As for corporations' larger losses, the rise of these new corporations made possible the accumulation of much greater amounts of capital and hence made possible much larger manufacturing and business enterprises. Investments alone, however, still provided too little capital to meet the demands of the most ambitious businesses. Such businesses replied, relied heavily on credit and their borrowing often created dangerous instability. Credit mechanisms remained very crude in the early 19th century. The government alone could issue official currency, but the official currency consisted only of gold and silver or paper certificates backed literally by gold and silver and there was thus too little of it to support the growing demand for credit. Under pressure from corporate promoters, many banks issued large quantities of banknotes, unofficial currency that circulated in much the same way that government currency did, but was of much less stable value. But the notes had value only to be to the degree that the bank would sustain public confidence in their value. And some banks issued so many notes that their own reserves could not cover them. As a result, bank failures were frequent and bank deposits were often insecure. The difficulty of, of obtaining credit for business investments remained therefore an impediment to economic growth. The Emergence of the Factory, pages 275 and 276. The most profound economic development in mid-19th century America was the rise of the factory. Before the War of 1812, most of what manufacturing there was in the United States took place within private households or in small individually operated workshops. Men and women built or made products by hand or with simple machines such as hand operated looms. Gradually, however, improved technology and increasing demand produced a fundamental change. It came first in the New England textile industry there, entrepreneurs were beginning to make use of new and larger machines driven by water power that allowed them to bring textile operations together under a single roof. This factory system, as it came to be known, spread rapidly in the 1820s and began to make serious 
inroads into the old home-based system of spinning thread and weaving cloth. Factories also penetrated the shoe industry. Concentrated in eastern Massachusetts, shoes were still largely handmade, but manufacturers were beginning to employ workers who specialized in one or another of the various tasks involved in production. Some factories began producing large numbers of identical shoes in ungraded sizes without distinction as to rights and lefts. By the 1830s, factory production was spreading from textiles and shoes into other industries and from New England to other areas of the Northeast. Between 1840 and 1860, American industry experienced even more dramatic growth as the factory system spread rapidly. In 1840, the total value of manufactured goods produced in the United States stood at $483 million. Ten years later, the figure had climbed to over $1 billion, and in 1860, it reached close to $2 billion. For the first time, the value of manufactured goods was approximately equal to that of agricultural products. Of the approximately 140,000 manufacturing establishments in the country in 1860, 74,000 were located in the Northeast. The Northeast plants were so large that the region produced more than two-thirds of the nation's manufactured goods. Of the 1,311,000 workers in manufacturing in the United States, about 938,000 were employed in the mills and factories of New England and the Mid-Atlantic States. Advances in Technology, page 276 and 277. Even the most highly developed industries were still relatively immature by later standards. American cotton manufacturers, for example, produced goods of coarse grade. Fine items continued to come from England, but machine technology advanced more rapidly in the United States in the mid 19th century when in any other country than in any other country in the world. The American economy was growing so rapidly that the rewards of de technological innovations were very great. Change was so rapid, in fact, that some manufacturers built their new machinery out of wood. By the time the wood wore out, they reasoned improved technology would have made the machine obsolete. By the beginning of the 1830s, American technology had become so advanced, particularly in textile manufacturing, that indus industrialists in Britain and Europe were beginning to travel to the United States to learn new techniques instead of the other way around. The manufacturing of machine tools, the tools used to make machinery parts, was an important contribution to manufacturing. The government supported such of the much of the research and development of machine tools, often in connection with supplying the military. For example, a government armory in Springfield, Massachusetts, developed two important tools the Tourette lathe used for cutting screws and other metal parts, and the universal milling machine, which replaced the hand chiseling of compli complicated parts and dies. Early in the 19th century, the precision, the precision grinding machine, which became critical to, among other things, the construction of sewing machines, was designed in the 1850s to help the United States Army produce standardized rifle parts. The federal armories, such as those at Springfield and Harper's Ferry, Virginia, became the breeding ground for many technological discoveries and a magnet for craftsmen and factory owners, looking for ideas that could be of use to them. By the 1840s, the machine tools used in the factories of the Northeast were already better than those in most European factories. Interchangeable parts, which Eli Whitney and Simeon 
North had tried to introduce into gun factories now found their way into many, many industries. Eventually, interchangeability would revolutionize watch and clock making. The manufacturing of locomotives and steam engines and making of many farm tools. It would also help make possible such newer devices as bicycles, sewing machines, typewriters, cash registers, and eventually the automobile. Industrialization was also profiting from the introduction of new sources of energy. Coal was replacing wood and water power as fuel for many factories. The production of coal, most of it mined around Pittsburgh in western Pennsylvania, leapt from 50,000 tons in 1820 to 14 million tons in 1860. The new power source made it possible to locate mills away from running streams and thus permitted industry to expand still more widely. The great Technological advances in American industry owed much to American inventors, as the patent records of the time make clear. In 1830, the number of inventions patented was 544. By 1850, the figure had risen to 993, and in 1860, it stood at 4,778. In 1839, Charles Goodyear, a New England hardware merchant, discovered a method of vulcanizing rubber, treating it to give it greater strength and elasticity. By 1860, this process had found over 500 uses and had helped create a major American rubber industry. In 1846, Elias Howe of Massachusetts constructed a sewing machine. Isaac Singer made improvements on it, and the Howe-Singer machine was soon being used in the manufacture of ready-to-wear clothes. For all the technological innovations that characterized the early factory system, most American industry remained wedded to the most traditional source of power, water. In the 1820s and 1830s, water power remained the most important source of power for manufacturing. The first important factory towns in New England, Lawrence Lowell and others, emerged where they did because of the natural waterfalls that could be channeled to provide power for the mills built along their banks. This sometimes required factories to close for periods in the winter <clears throat> when rivers were frozen. That was one reason factory owners began to look for alternative forms of energy that could be used, which led them by the late 1830s to rely more and more heavily on steam and other transportable forms of energy that could be fueled by wood and coal or later petroleum. Men and Women at Work, page 277. However sophisticated industrial firms became technologically and administratively, manufacturers still relied above all on a supply of labor. In the 1820s and 1830s, factory labor came primarily from the nation-born population. After 1840, the growing immigrant population became the most important new source of workers. S recruiting a Native Workforce, page 277, and then on 281 and 282. Recruiting a labor force was not an easy task. In the early years of the factory system, 90% of the American people in the 1820s still lived and worked on farms, and many urban residents were skilled artisans, independent craft workers who owned and managed their own shops as small businessmen. They were not likely to flock to factory jobs. The available unskilled workers were not numerous enough to form a reservoir from which the new industries could draw. 
The beginnings of an industrial labor supply came instead from the transformation of American agriculture in the 19th century. The opening of vast fertile new farmlands in the Midwest, the improvement of transportation systems, the development of new farm machinery, all combined to increase food production dramatically. New farming methods were also less labor intensive than the old ones. The number of workers required to produce large crops in the West was much smaller than the number required to produce smaller crops in the less fertile Northeast. No longer did each region have to feed itself entirely from its own farms. It could import food from other regions. As a, as a result, farmers and their families began to abandon some of the relatively unprofitable farming areas of the East. In the Northeast, especially in New England, were poor, where poor land had always placed harsh limits on farm productivity, rural people began leaving the land to work in the factories. Two systems of recruitment emerged to bring this new labor supply to the expanding textile mills. One common in the mid-Atlantic states, especially in such major manufacturing centers as New York and Philadelphia, brought whole families from the farm and farm to the mill. Parents tended looms alongside their children, some of whom were no more than four or five years old. The second system common in Massachusetts enlisted young women, mostly farmers, daughters, and their late teens and early 20s. It was known as the Lowell and Waltham system. After the factory towns in which it first emerged, many of these women worked for several years in the factories and saved their wages and returned home to marry and raise children. Others married men they met in the factories or in town and remained part of the industrial world but often stopped working in the mills to take up domestic roles instead. <clears throat> Page 281. Labor conditions in these early years of the factory system were significantly better than those in English industry. Better too than they would ultimately become in much of the United States. The employment of young children created undeniable hardships, but the misery was not as great as in European factories since working children in America usually remained under the supervision of their parents. In England, by contrast, asylum authorities often hired out orphans to factory owners who showed little concern for their welfare and kept them in something close to slavery. Even more different from the European labor pattern <clears throat> was the Lowell system, which relied heavily, indeed, almost exclusively on young unmarried women. In England and other areas of industrial Europe, the conditions of work for women were often horrifyingly bad. A British parliamentary investigation revealed, for example, that women workers in the coal miners endured unimaginably wretched conditions. Some had to crawl on their hands and knees naked and filthy through cramped and narrow tunnels, pulling heavy coal carts behind them. It was little wonder that English visitors to America considered the Lowell Mills a female paradise by contrast. The Lowell <coughs> workers lived in clean boarding houses and dormitories which the factory owners remained maintained for them. They were well fed and carefully supervised because many New Englanders considered the employment of women to be vaguely immoral. The factory owners placed great emphasis on maintaining a proper environment for their employees, enforcing strict curfews and requiring regular church attendance. Employers quickly dismissed women suspected of immoral conduct. Wages for the Lowell workers were generous by the standard of the time. The women even found time to write and publish a monthly magazine, The Lowell Offering. 
Yet even these relatively well-treated workers often found the transition from farm life to factory work difficult. Even traumatic, uprooted from everything familiar, forced to live among strangers in a regimented environment, many women suffered from severe loneliness and disorientation. Still more had difficulty adjusting to the nature of factory work. The repetition of fixed tasks hour after hour, day after day, that the women had to labor from sunrise to sunset was not in itself a new experience. Many of them had worked similarly long days on the farm, but that they now had to spend these days performing tedious, unvarying chores, and that their schedules did not change from week to week or season to season, made the adjustment to factory work especially painful. But however uncomfortable women may have found factory work, they had few other options. They were barred from such manual labor as construction or from work as sailors or on the docks. Most of society considered it unthinkable for women to travel the country alone as many men did in search of opportunities. Work in the mills was in many cases the only alternative to returning to farms that could no longer support them. The paternalistic factory system of Lowell did not in any case survive for long. In the competitive textile market, as it developed in the 1830s and 1840s, a market prey to the booms and busts that afflicted the American economy as a whole Manufacturers found it difficult to maintain the relatively high living standards and the reasonably attractive working conditions which, with which they had begun. Wages declined, the hours of work lengthened, the conditions of the boarding houses deteriorated as the buildings decayed and overcrowding increased. In 1834, mill workers in Lowell, organized a union, the Factory Girls Association, which staged a strike to protest a 25% wage cut. Two years later, the association struck again against a rent increase in the boarding houses. Both strikes failed, and a recession in 1837 virtually destroyed the organization. Eight years later, the Lowell women, led by the militant Sarah Bagley, created the Female Labor Reform Association and began demanding a 10-hour day. Some women worked 12-hour shifts and for improvements in conditions in the mill. The new association not only made demands of management, it also turned to state government and asked for legislative investigation of conditions in the mills. By then, however, the character of the factory workforce was changing again. The young women who had worked in the mills were gradually moving into other occupations, teaching or domestic service or marriage, and textile ma uh, manufacturers were turning to a less contentious labor supply, immigrants. The immigrant workforce, pages 282 and 283. The rapidly increasing supply of immigrant workers after 1840 was a boon to manufacturers and other entrepreneurs. At last, they had access to a source of labor that was both large and inexpensive. These new workers, because of their vast numbers and their famili unfamiliarity with their new country, had less leverage than the women they at, they at times displaced. As a result, they often encountered far worse working conditions. Construction gangs made up increasingly of Irish immigrants performed the heavy unskilled work on turnpikes, canals, and railroads under often intolerable conditions. Because most of these workers had no marketable skills and because of native prejudice against them, they received wages so low and so intermittently since the work was seasonal and uncertain 
that they generally did not earn enough to support their families in even minimal comfort. Many of them lived in flimsy shanties in grim conditions that endangered the health of their families and reinforced native prejudices toward the shanty Irish. The arrival of Irish workers accelerated the deterioration of working conditions in New England. There was far less social pressure on owners to provide a decent environment for Irish workers than there had been for native women. Employers began paying peace rates, wages tied to how much a worker produced rather than a daily wage and employed other devices to speed up production and use the labor force <clears throat> more profitably and efficiently. By the mid 1840s, the town of Lowell, once a model for foreign visitors of enlightened industrial development, had become a squalid slum. Similarly, miserable working class neighborhoods were emerging in other northeastern cities. Conditions were still not as bad as in most factory towns in England and Europe, but in almost all industrial areas, factories themselves were becoming large, noisy, unsanitary, and often dangerous workplaces places to work. The average workday was extending to 12, often 14 hours. Wages were declining so that even skilled male workers could hope to earn only from $4 to $10 per week. While unskilled laborers were likely to earn only about $1 to $6 per week, women and children, whatever their skill, also earned less than most men. <clears throat> the factory system and the artisan tradition, page 283. It was not only the mill workers who suffered from the transition of the modern factory system. It was also the skilled artisans whose trades the factories were displacing. The artisan tradition was as much a part of the older Republican vision of America as the tradition of sturdy, independent yeomen farmers. Independent craftsmen considered themselves Embodiments of the American ideal, they clung to a vision of economic life that was in some ways very different from what the new capitalist class was promoting. Skilled artisans valued their independence. They also valued the stability and relative equality within their economic world. The factory system threatened that world with obsolescence, some uh, obsolescence. Some artisans made successful transitions into small-scale industry, but others found themselves unable to compete with the new factory-made goods that sold for a fraction of the artisans' prices. In the face of this competition from industrial capitalists, craftsmen began early in the 19th century to form organizations. Working men's political parties and the first American labor unions to protect their endangered positions and to resist the new economic order. As early as the 1790s, printers and co cord gainers, makers of high quality boots and shoes, took the lead. Members of other skilled trades, carpenters, joiners, masons, plasterers, hatters, and shipbuilders felt similarly vulnerable. In such cities as Philadelphia, Baltimore, Boston, and New York, the skilled workers of each craft formed societies for mutual aid. During the 1820s and 1830s, the craft societies began to combine on a citywide basis and set up central organizations known as trade unions. With the widening of markets, the economies of cities were interconnected, so workers soon realized there were advantages in joining forces. They established national unions or federations of local ones 
In 1834, delegates from six cities founded the National Trades Union, and in 1836, the printers and the cord wainers set up their own national craft unions. This early craft union movement fared poorly. Labor leaders struggled against the handicap of hostile laws and hostile courts. The common law as interpreted, interpreted by the courts in the industrial states viewed a combination among workers as in itself an illegal conspiracy. The Panic of 1837, a dramatic financial collapse that produced a severe recession, weakened the movement further. Fighting for Control, page 283 and 284. Workers at all levels of the emerging industrial economy attempted to approve their lots. They tried with little success to persuade state legislatures to pass laws setting a maximum work workday. Two states, New Hampshire in 1847 and Pennsylvania in 1848, actually passed 10-hour laws limiting the workday unless the workers agreed to an express contract calling for more time on the job. Such measures were virtually without impact. However, because the employers could simply require pr prospective employees to sign the express contract as a condition of hiring, three states, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Pennsylvania, passed laws regulating child labor, but again, the results were minimal. The laws simply limited the workday to 10 hours for children unless their parents agreed to something longer. Employers had little difficulty persuading parents to consent to additional hours. Perhaps the greatest legal victory of industrial workers came in Massachusetts in 1842 when the Supreme Court of the state in Commonwealth versus Hunt declared that unions were lawful organizations and that the strike was a lawful weapon. Other state courts gradually accepted the principles of the Massachusetts decision on the whole. However, the union movement of the 1840s and 1850s remained generally ineffective. Some workers were reluctant to think of themselves as members of a permanent laboring force and resisted uh, joining unions. <clears throat> but even those unions that did manage to recruit significant numbers of industrial workers were usually not large enough or strong enough to stage strikes and even less frequently strong enough to win them. Artisans and skilled workers, despite their setbacks in the 1830s, had somewhat greater success than did factory workers, but their unions often had more in common with pre-industrial guilds than with modern labor organizations. In most cases, their primary purpose was to protect the favored position of their members in the labor force by restricting admission to the skilled trades. The organizing effort that had floundered in the 1830s revived impressively in the 1850s. Among the new organizations skilled workers created were the National Typographical or Typographical Union founded in 1852, the Stonecutters in 1853, the Hat Finishers in 1854, and the Molders and the Machinists both in 1859. Virtually all the early craft unions excluded women, even though female workers were numerous in almost every industry and craft. As a result, women began establishing their own protective union by the 1850s, often with the support of middle-class female reformers. <clears throat> like the male craft unions, the female protective unions had little power in dealing with employers. They did, however, serve an important role as mutual aid societies for women workers. Despite these persistent efforts, efforts at organization and protest, the American working class in the 1840s and the 1850s 
was notable for its relatively modest power. In England, workers were becoming a powerful, united, and often violent economic and political force. They were creating widespread social turmoil and helping to transform the nation's political structure. In America, nothing of the sort happened. Many factors combined to inhibit the growth of effective labor resistance. Among the most important was the flood of immigrant laborers in the country. The newcomers were usually willing to work for lower wages than native workers. Because they were so numerous, manufacturers had little difficulty replacing disgruntled or striking workers with eager immigrants. Ethnic divisions and tensions both between natives and immigrants and among the various immigrant groups themselves often led workers to channel their resentments against employers. There was to the sheer strength of the industrial capitalists who had not only economic but also political and social power and could usually triumph over even the most militant challenges. Free Labor, page 284. Despite the many obstacles and challenges that faced Northern workers in the first half of the 19th century, nothing was more important than the idea of personal freedom. Most workers had hard lives, but they were proud of their personal freedoms and considered themselves what some called the sovereign individual, people who could, at least in theory, make choices and change their lives. Modern notions of freedom were much more robust than those of the early 19th century, when only a few men and no women were able to vote, when workers were sometimes bound to their employers for years, when women were subject, subjugated to their husbands, and when, of course, millions of African Americans were living with almost no freedom. But in, in but even in the early years of American history, the belief in the freedom of the individual was strong. In the North, in particular, personal liberty was growing exponentially for more and more Americans. By the mid-19th century, most white Americans identified themselves as free individuals, no matter what their occupations or means. Some of the great philosophers of 19th century America argued that the independency of the individual required free people to escape from the market economy and find freedom in solitude and the wonder of nature. As Henry David Thoreau tried to do in his famous retreat to live alone in a cabin on Walden Pond in Cordon, Massachusetts, Concord, Massachusetts. Um, but for most Americans, the opportunity for solitude and communion with nature were slim. For most Northern workers, freedom meant the absence of slavery. It meant that they could leave jobs that did not want, they did not want, move to new areas of the country and seek opportunities to change their lives. Their material circumstances were sometimes far worse than those of many slaves in the South. Still, they believed that their lives were better than those who lacked freedom. And when the great debate over slavery began in the 1840s and 1850s, Northern laborers, however, had their own lots, ad adhorred slavery both because it was the antithesis of freedom and because they feared that slavery threatened the jobs of free laborers. Not only slaves were de denied the freedom that most Americans valued, the more than 200,000 free black men and women living in the North and a few in the South remained ineligible to vote and were not considered legal citizens. Many of the free blacks in the North were people who had been skilled crafts workers as slaves and who brought or were given their freedom, but their lots were in many ways worse than when they were working in the South. In the northern cities to which many free blacks moved, there were many white craftsmen already who saw black workers as rivals. Most free blacks worked in menial jobs and as domestic servants. Patterns of Industrial Society, page 284. 
the Industrial Revolution made the United States and the and particularly its more economical developed regions dramatically wealthier almost every year. It was also making society more unequal and it trans transformed social relationships and everyday life at almost every level from the workplace to family. The Rich and the Poor, page 284, 285, and a little bit of 286. The commercial and industrial growth of the United States greatly elevated the average income of the American people, but this increasing wealth was being distributed highly unequally. Substantial groups of the population shared hardly at all in the economic growth, slaves, Indians, landless farmers, and many of the unskilled workers on the fringe of the manufacturing system. But even among the rest of the population, disparities of income were marked. Wealth had always been unequally distributed in the United States, to be sure. Even in the era of the revolution, according to some estimates, 45% of the wealth was concentrated in the hands of about 10% of the population. But by the mid 19th century, that concentration had become far more pronounced. In Boston, 1845, for example, 4% of the citizens are estimated to have owned more than 65% of the wealth. In Philadelphia in 1860, 1% of the population possessed more than half of the wealth. Uh, among the American people overall in 1860, according to scholarly estimates, 5% of the families possessed more than 50% of the wealth. There had been wealthy classes in America almost from the beginning of European settlement, but the extent and the character of wealth were changing in response to the commercial revolution of the mid 19th century. Merchants and industrialists were accumulating enormous fortunes, and because there was now a significant number of rich people living in the cities, a distinctive culture of wealth began to emerge. In large city people, cities, people of great wealth gathered together in neighborhoods of great opulence. They founded clubs and developed elaborate social rituals. They looked increasingly far for ways to display their wealth. In the great mansions, they built the showy carriages in which they rode, the lavish households, household goods they accumulated, the clothes they wore, the elegant social establishments they patronized. New York, which had more wealthy families than anywhere else, developed a particularly elaborate high society. The construction of the city's great central park, which began in 1850s, was in part a result of pressure from the members of high society who wanted an elegant setting for the daily carriage rides. There was also a significant population of genuinely destitute people emerging in the growing urban centers of the nation. These were people who were not merely poor in the sense of having to struggle to sustain themselves. Most Americans were poor in the sense they were almost entirely without resources, often homeless, dependent on charity or crime or both for survival. Some of these paupers, as temp contemporaries called them, were recent immigrants who had failed to find work or to adjust to life in, in the new world. Some were widows and orphans, stripped of the family structures that allowed most working class Americans to survive. Some were people suffering from alcoholism or mental illness, unable to work. Others were victims of native prejudice, bared from all but the most menial employment because of race or ethnicity. The Irish were particular victims of such pre prejudice. Among the worst off were free blacks. African American communities in antebellum northern cities were small by later standards, but most major urban areas had significant black populations. Some of these African Americans 
were descendants of families that had lived in the North for generations. Others were former slaves who had escaped from the South or even released by their masters or had bought their freedom. Some former slaves, once free, then worked to buy the freedom of relatives left behind. In material terms, at least, life was not always much better for them in the North than it had been in slavery. Most had access only to very menial jobs, which usually paid too little to allow workers to support their families or educate their children. In bad times, many had access to no jobs at all. In small, in most parts of the North, blacks and could not vote, could not attend public school, indeed could not use any of the public services available to white residents. Most blacks prefer life in the North, however, arduous to life in the South because it permitted them at least some level of freedom. Social mobility, page 286 and 287. <clears throat> One might expect the contrast between conspicuous wealth and conspicuous poverty in, in antebellum America to have an encouraged more class conflict than actually occurred. But a number of factors operated to limit resentments. For one thing, however, much of the relative economic position of American workers may have been declining. The absolute living standard of most laborers was improving. Life in material terms, at least, was usually better for factory workers than it had been on the farms or in the European societies from which they had migrated. They ate better, they were often better clothed and housed, and they had greater access to consumer goods. There was also a significant amount of mobility within the working class which helped to limit discontent. Opportunities for social mobility, for working one's way up the economic ladder were relatively modest. A few workers did manage to move from poverty to riches by dint of work, ingenuity, and luck. A very small number, but enough to support the dreams of those who watched them. And a much larger number of workers managed to move at least one notch up the ladder. For example, becoming in the course of a lifetime a skilled rather than an unskilled laborer. Such people could envision their children and grandchildren moving up even further. More common than social mobility was geographic mobility, which was even more extensive in the United States than in Europe, where it was considerable. America had a huge expanse of uncultivated land in the West, much of it open for settlement for the first time in the 1840s and 1850s. Some workers saved money, brought bought land and moved west to farm it. The historian Frederick Jackson Turner later referred to the availability of western lands as a safety valve for discontent, a basic explanation for the relative lack of social conflict in the antebellum United States. But few urban workers and even fewer poor ones could afford to make such a move or had the expertise to know how to work land even if they could. Much more common was the movement of laborers from one industrial town to another, restless questing, sometimes hopeful, sometimes despairing. These frequently moving people were often the victims of layoffs, looking for better opportunities ever elsewhere. Their searches may seldom have led to a marked improvement in their circumstances, but the rootlessness of this large segment of the workforce, one of the most distress, distressed segments, made effective organization and protest difficult. There was finally another safety valve for working class discontent, politics, economic opportunity may not have greatly expanded in the 19th century, but the opportunity to participate in politics did, and to many white male working people, access to the ballot seemed to offer a way to help guide their society to feel like a significant part of their communities. Middle Class Life, page 287.
for all the visibility of the very rich and the very poor in antebellum society, the fastest growing group uh, in America was the middle class. The expansion of the middle class was in part a result of the growth of the industrial economy and the increasing commercial life that accompanied it. Economic development opened many more opportunities for people to own or work in businesses, to own shops, to engage in trade, to enter professions, and to administer organizations. In earlier times, when ownership of land had been the only real basis of wealth, society had been divided between people with little or no land, people Europeans generally called peasants and a land gentry, which in Europe usually meant an inherited aristocracy. <clears throat> Once commerce and industry became a source of wealth, these rigid distinctions broke down and many people could become prosperous without owning land. But by providing valuable services to the new economy or by owning capital other than land, Middle-class life in the years before the Civil War rapidly established itself as the most influential cultural form of urban America. Middle-class families lived in solid and often substantial homes, which, like the wealthy, they tended to own. Workers and art artisans were increasingly becoming renters, a relatively new phenomenon in American cities that spread widely in the early 19th century. Middle-class women tended to remain in the home and care for their children and the household, although increasingly they were also able to hire servants, usually young unmarried immigrant women who put in long hours of arduous work for their little money. One of the aspirations of middle-class women in an age when doing the family's laundry could take an entire day was to escape from one of the one of the drudgery of housework new household inventions altered and great greatly improved the character of life in middle class homes perhaps the most important was the invention of the cast iron stove which began to replace the fireplaces as the principal vehicle for cooking and also as an important source of heat. These wood or coal burning devices were hot, clumsy, and dirty by the standards of the 21st century, but compared to the convenience and danger of cooking on an open hearth, <clears throat> they seemed a great luxury. Stoves gave cooks more control over the preparation of food and allowed them to cook several things at once. Middle-class diets were changing rapidly in the antebellum years, and not just because of the wider range of cooking the stove made possible. The expansion and diversification of American agriculture and the ability of farmers to ship goods to urban markets by rail from distant regions greatly increased the variety of food available in cities. Fruits and vegetables were difficult to ship over long distances in an age with little refrigeration, but families had access to a greater variety of meats, grains, and dairy products than they had had in the past. A few households acquired ice boxes in the years before the Civil War, and the sight of wagons delivering large chunks of ice to wealthy and middle-class homes began to become a familiar part of urban life. Ice boxes allowed their owners to keep fresh meat and dairy products for as long as several days without spoilage. Most families, however, did not yet have any kind of re refrigeration. Reversing food, pre preserving food for them meant curing meat with salt and preserving fruits in sugar. Diets were generally much heavier and starchier, starchier than they were they are today, and middle class people tended to be considerably stouter than would be fashionable in the 21st century. Middle class homes came to d 
differentiate themselves from those of workers and artisans in other ways as well. They were more elaborately decorated and furnished with household goods made available for the first time through factory production. Houses that had once had bare walls and floors now had carpeting, wallpaper, and curtains. The spare, simple styles of 18th century homes gave way to the much more elaborate, even Baroque household styles of the early Victorian era styles. Increasingly characterized by, cr by crowded, even cluttered rooms, dark colors, lush fabrics, and heavy furniture and draperies. Middle-class homes also became larger. It became less common for children to share beds and less common for all family members to sleep in the same room. Parlors and dining rooms separate from the kitchen, once a luxury reserved largely for the wealthy, became the norm for the middle class as well. Some urban middle-class homes had indoor plumbing and indoor toilets. By the 1850s, a significant advance over the outdoor wells and privies that had been virtually universal only a few years earlier and that remained common among working class people. The Changing Family, pages 287, 288, and 289. The new industrializing society of the northern region of the United States produced profound changes in the nature and function of the family. At the heart of the transformation was the movement of families from farms to urban areas where jobs, not land, were the most valued commodities. The patriarchal system of the countryside whereby fathers controlled their children's futures by controlling the distribution of land to them could not survive the move to a city or town. Sons and daughters were much more likely to leave the family in search of work than they were, had been in the rural world. Another important change was the shift of income earning work out of the home and into the shop, mill, or factory. In the early decades of the 19th century and for many years before that, the family itself had been the principal unit of economic activity. Many uh, family farms, family shops, and family industries were the norm throughout most of the United States. Men, women, and children worked together sharing tasks and jointly earning the income that sustained the family. But as farming spread to the fertile lands of the Northwest and as the size and profitable profitability of farms expanded, agriculture work became more commercialized. Farm owners in need of labor began to rely less on their families, which often were not large enough to, dis to satisfy the demand, and more on hired male workers. These farm hands performed many of the tasks that on smaller farms had once become, had once been the jobs of the women and children of the family. As a result, farm women tended to work increasingly at domestic tasks, cooking, sewing, gardening, and dairying. <clears throat> a development that spared them from <clears throat> some heavy labor, but that also removed them from the principal income producing activities of the farm. See chapter 11 for a discussion of family relations in agrarian South. <clears throat> in the industrial income of the rapidly growing cities, there was an even more significant decline in the traditional economic functions of the family. The urban household itself became less important as a center of production. Instead, most of the income earners left home each day to work elsewhere. A sharp distinction began to emerge between the public world of the workplace the world of commerce and industry, and the private world of the family. The world of the family was now more often dominated not by production, but by housekeeping, child rearing, and other primarily domestic concerns. It was also a world dominated by women, accompanying and perhaps in part caused by the changing economic function of the family was 
a decline in the birth rate. <clears throat> in 1800, the average American woman could be expected to give birth to approximately seven children during her childbearing years. By 1860, the average woman bore five. The birth rate fell most quickly in urban areas and among middle-class women. <coughs> Mid-19th century Americans had access to some birth control devices, which undoubtedly contributed in part to the change. There was also a significant rise in abortion, which remained legal in some states until after the Civil War, and which, according to some estimates, may have terminated as many as 20% of all pregnancies in the 1850s. But the most important cause of the declining birth rate was almost certainly changes in sexual behavior, including increased abstinence. Women of the Cult of Domesticity Pages 289, 290, 291, and 292. The emerging distinction between the public and private worlds, between the workplace and the home, led to increasingly sharp distinctions between the social roles of men and women. Those distinctions affected not only factory workers and farmers, but members of the growing middle class as well. There had, of course, always been important differences between the male and female spheres in American society. Women had long been denied many legal and political rights enjoyed by men within the family. The husband and father had traditionally ruled and the wife and mother had generally bowed to this de his demands and desires. It had long been practically impossible for most women to obtain divorces, although divorces initiated by men were often easier to arrange. Men were also far more likely than women to win custody of children in case of divorce. In most states, husbands retained almost absolute authority over both the property and the persons of their wives. Wife beating was illegal in only a few areas and the law did not acknowledge that rape could occur within marriage. Women traditionally had very little access to the world of business or politics. Indeed, in most communities, custom dictated that women never speak in public before mixed audiences. Most women also had much less access to education than men, a situation that survived into the mid 19th century. Although they were encouraged to attend school at the elementary level, they were strongly discouraged and in most cases effectively barred from pursuing higher education. Oberlin in Ohio became the first college in America to accept female students. It permitted four to enroll in 1837, despite criticism that co-education was a rash experiment approximating free love. Oberlin authorities were con confident that the mutual influence of the sexes upon each other is decidedly happy in the cultivation of both mind and manners, but the few other institutions shared their views. Coeducation remained extraordinarily rare until long after the Civil War, and only a few women's colleges, such as Mount Holyoke, founded in Massachusetts by Mary Lyon in 1837, emerged. No longer income producers, middle class women became guardians of the domestic virtues. Their role as mothers entrusted with the nurturing of the young seemed more central to the family than it had in the past, and their role as wives, as companions, and helpers to their husbands grew more important as well. Middle class women also became more important as consumers. They learned to place a high value on keeping a clean, comfortable, and well-appointed home, and entertaining on entertaining and on dressing elegantly and stylishly. 
occupying their own separate sphere, some women began to develop a distinctive female culture. Friendships among women became increasingly intense. Women began to form their own social networks and ultimately to form female clubs and associations that were of great importance to the advancement of various reforms. A distinctive feminine literature began to emerge to meet the demands of middle class women. There were women's magazines, of which the most prominent was Godey's Lady Book, Ladies Book, edited after 1837 by Sarah Hale. The magazine scrupulously avoided dealing with public controversies or political issues and focused instead on fashions, shopping, and homemaking advice and other purely domestic concerns. Politics and religion were inappropriate for the magazine. Hale explained in 1841, because other subjects are more important for our sex and more proper for our sphere. By the standards of a later era, the increasing isolation of women from the public world seemed to be a form of oppression and discrimination. And it is true that few men considered women fit for business, politics, or the professions. On the other hand, most middle-class men and many middle-class women as well considered the new female sphere vehicle for expressing special qualities that made women in some ways superior to men. Women were to be the custodians of morality and benevolence, just as the home shaped by the influence of women was to be re refuge from the harsh, competitive world of the marketplace. It was women's responsibility to provide religious and moral instruction to their children and to counterbalance the inquisitive secular impulses of their husbands. Thus, the cult of domesticity, as some scholars have called it, brought both benefits and costs to middle-class women. It allowed them to live lives of greater material comfort than in the past, and it placed a higher value on their female virtues and on their roles as wife and mother. At the same time, it left women increasingly detached from the public world with few outlets for their other interests and energies. The cost of that detachment were particularly clear among unmarried women of the middle class. By the 1840s, the ideology of domesticity had grown so powerful that few gen genteel women would only long any longer consider working as many had in the past in shops or mills, and few employers would consider hiring them. But unmarried women, nevertheless, required some income producing activity. They had few choices. Some could become teachers or nurses, professions that seemed to call for the same female qualities that made women important within the home. And both of those professions began in the 1840s and 1850s to attract significant numbers of women, although not until the Civil War did females begin to dominate them. Otherwise, unmarried females were largely dependent on the generosity of relatives or hired as governesses for children or companies for widows and other women, companions for widows and other women. Middle class people gradually came to consider work by women outside the household to be unseemly something characteristic of the lower classes, as indeed it was, but working class women could not afford to stay home and cultivate the domestic, domestic virtues. They had to produce income for their families. They continued to work in factories and mills, but under conditions far worse than those that the original, more respectable women workers had once enjoyed. They also frequently found themselves in middle-class homes. Domestic service became one of the most important sources of female employment. In other words, now that production had moved outside the household, women who needed to earn money had to move outside their own households to do so. Leisure Activities, page 292 and 293. 
Leisure time was scarce for all but the wealthiest Americans in the mid-19th century. Most people worked long hours. Saturday was a normal working day. Vacations, paid or unpaid, were rare. For most people, Sunday was the only respite from work and was generally reserved for religion and rest. Almost no commercial establishments did any business at all on Sunday. And even within the home, many families frowned upon playing games or engaging in other kinds of entertainment on the Sabbath. For working class and middle class people, therefore, holidays took on a special importance. That was one reason for the strikingly elaborate 4th of July celebrations throughout the country. The celebrations were not just expressions of patriotism. They were a way of enjoying one of the few holidays from work available to virtually all Americans. In rural America, where most people still lived, the erratic pattern of farm work gave many people some relief from the relentless working schedules of city, city residents. For urban people, however, leisure was something to be seized in what few free mo moments they had. Men gravitated to the taverns for drinking, talking, and game playing. Women gathered in one another's homes for conversation, card games, or to share work on such household tasks as sewing. For educated people, those numbers were rapidly expanding. Reading became one of the principal leisure activities. Newspapers and magazines proliferated rapidly and books, novels, histories, autobiographies, biographies, travelogues, and others became staples of affluent homes. Many were particularly avid readers and women writers created a new genre of fiction, especially for females. The sentimental novel, which often offered idealized visions of women's lives and romances. There was also a vigorous culture of public leisure, even if many families had to struggle to find time or means to participate in it. In larger cities, theaters were becoming increasingly popular, and while some of them catered to particular social groups, others attracted audiences that crossed lanes, class lanes. Wealthy people, middle class people, workers, and their families all could sometimes be found watching a performance of Shakespeare or a melodrama based on a popular novel or an American myth. Minstrel shows in which white actors mimicked and ridiculed African American culture became increasingly popular. Public sporting events, boxing, horse racing, cockfighting all already becoming controversial and others often attracted considerable crowds baseball not yet organized into professional leagues was beginning to attract large crowds and when played in city parks or fields on the edge of town edges of town a particularly exciting event in many communities was the arrival of the citrus a oh, excuse me circus a traveling entertainment with roots in the Middle Ages that continued to entertain, delight, and bamboozle children and adults alike. Popular tastes in public spectacle tended toward the bizarre and the fantastic. Most men and women lived in a constricted world of familiar things. Relatively few people traveled, and in the absence of film, radio, television, or even much photography, they hungered for visions of unusual phenomena that con contrasted with their normal experiences. People going to the theater or the circus or the museum wanted to see things that amazed and even frightened them. Perhaps the most celebrated provider of such experiences was the famous and unscrupulous showman P.T. Barnum, who opened the American Museum in New York in 1842. Not a showcase for art or nature, but a great freak show populated by midgets, the most famous name, Tom Thumb, Siamese twins, magicians, and ventriloquists. 
Barnum was a genius in publicizing his venues, ventures with garish posters and elaborate newspaper announcements. Only later in the 1870s did he launch the famous circus for which he is still best remembered, but he was always a pioneer in exploiting public taste for the wild and exotic. One of the ways Barnum tried to draw visitors to his museum was by engaging lectures. He did so because he understood that the lecture was one of the most popular forms of entertainment in 19th century America. Men and women flocked in enormous numbers to lyceums, churches, schools, and auditoriums to hear lectures, explain the latest advances in science, to describe their visits to exotic places, to provide vivid historical narratives, or to rail against the evils of alcohol or slavery. Messages of social uplift and reform attracted rapt audiences, particularly among women eager for guidance as they adjusted to the often jarring changes in the character of family life in the industrializing world. The Agricultural North, page 293. Given in the rapidly urbanizing and industrializing Northeast and more so in the 19th century Americans called the Northwest and what Americans today call the Midwest, most people remained tied to the agricultural world but agriculture, like industry and commerce, was becoming increasingly a part of the new capitalist econ economy. Linked to the national and international market, where agriculture could not complete, compete in this new commercial world, it declined. Where it could compete, it simultaneously flourished and changed. Northeastern Agriculture the story of agriculture in the Northeast after 1840 uh, is one of decline and transformation. The reason for the decline was simple. The farmers of the section could no longer compete with the new and richer soil of the Northwest. Centers of production were gradually shifting westward for many of the farm goods that had in the past been most important to Northeastern agriculture wheat, corn, grapes, cattle, sheep, and hogs. Some eastern farmers responded to these changes by moving west themselves and establishing new farms. Still others moved to mill towns and became laborers. Some farmers, however, remained on the land and managed to hold their own. As the eastern urban centers increased in population, many farmers turned to the task of supplying food to nearby cities. They raised vegetables, truck farming, or fruit, and sold it in local towns. New York, for example, led all other states in apple production. The rise of cities also stimulated the rise of profitable dairy farming. Approximately half the dairy products of the country were produced in the east. Most of the rest came from the west, where Ohio was the leading dairy state partly because of the expansion of the dairy industry and the Northeast led other sections on the production of hay. New York was the leading hay state in the nation. Pennsylvania and New England grew large crops as well. The Northeast also exceeded other areas in producing potatoes. But while agriculture in the region maintained an important part of the economy, it was steadily becoming less important than the industrial growth of the Northeast itself. As a result, the, natural popula the rural population in many parts of the Northeast continued to decline. The Old Northwest, pages 293 and 294. There was some indi industry in the states of the Northwest, more than in the South, and in the two decades before the Civil War, the region experienced steady un industrial growth by 1860. It had 36,785 manufacturing establishments, employing 209,909 workers. 
There was a flourishing industri industrial and commercial area along the shore of Lake Erie with Cleveland at its center. Another manufacturing region was in the Ohio River Valley. The meatpacking city of Cincinnati was its nucleus. Farther west, the rising city of Chicago, destined to become the great metropolis of the region, was emerging as the national center of the agricultural machinery and meatpacking industries. Most of the major industrial activities of the west either served agriculture, as in the case of farm machinery, or relied on agricultural products, as in flour milling, meatpacking, whiskey distilling, and the making of leather goods. <clears throat> As this suggests, industry was, on the whole, much less important in the Northwest than farming. Some areas of the Northwest were not yet dominated by whites. Indians remained the most numerous inhabitants of much of the upper third of the Great Lakes states until after the Civil War. In those areas, hunting and fishing, along with some sedentary agriculture, remain the principal economic activities of both whites and Native Americans. But the tribes did not become integrated into the new commercialized economy that was emerging elsewhere in the Northwest. For the white and occasionally black settlers who populated the lands farther south, the Northwest was primarily an agricultural region. Its rich and plentiful lands were farming a lucrative and expanding activity there. In contrast to the declining ag agrarian Northeast, thus the typical citizen of the Northwest was not an individual worker or poor marginal farmer, but the owner of a reasonably prosperous family farm. The average size of Western farms was 200 acres, the majority of them owned by people who worked them. Rising farm prices around the world provided a strong incentive for those for these Western farmers to engage in commercial agriculture. That usually meant concentrating on a single crop for market, corn, wheat, cattle, sheep, hogs, and others. In the early years of white settlement in the Northwest, farm prices rose because of the debilitation of European agriculture. In the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars and the growing urban population, and hence the growing demand for food, of industrializing areas of Europe, the Northwest with good water routes on the Mississippi for getting its crops to ocean-going vessels profited from this international trade. But industrialization in both the United States and Europe provided the greatest boost of agriculture with the growth of facilities, factories, and cities in the Northeast. The domestic market for farm goods increased dramatically. The growing national and worldwide demand for farm products resulted in steadily rising farm prices. For most farmers, the 1840s and early 1850s were years of increasing prosperity. To meet the increasing demand for its farm products, residents of the Northwest worked tremendous, oh, strenuously and often frantically to increase their productive capacities. Many tried to take advantage of the large areas of still uncultivated land and to enlarge the area of white settlement during the 1840s. By 1850, the growing Western population was moving into the prairie regions, both east and west of the Mississippi into areas of Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, Missouri, Iowa, and Minnesota. Residents cleared forest lands or made use of fields. The Indians had cleared many years earlier, and they began to develop a timber industry to make use of the forests that remained. Wheat was the staple crop of the region, but other crops, corn, potatoes, and oats, and livestock were also important. The nor Northwest increased production not only by expanding the area of settlement, but also by adopting new 
agricultural technologies that greatly reduced the labor necessary for producing a crop and slowed the exhaustion of the region's rich soil. Farmers began to cultivate new varieties of seed, notably Mediterranean wheat, which was hardier than the native type. And they imported better breeds of animals, such as hogs and sheep from England and Spain to take the place of native stock. Most important were improved tools and farm machines, which American inventors and manufacturers produced in rapidly increasing numbers. During the 1840s, more efficient grain drills, harrows, mowers, and hay rakes came into wide use. The cast iron plow and earlier innovation remained popular because in its parts could be replaced when broken. An even better tool appeared in 1847 when John Deere established at Malone, Illinois, a factory to manufacture steel plows, which were more durable than those made of iron. Two new machines heralded a coming revolution in grain production. The most important was the automatic reaper, the invention of Cyrus H. McCormick of Virginia. The reaper enabled one worker to harvest as much wheat or any uh, or any other small grain in a day as five could harvest using other methods. McCormick, who had patented his device in 1834, established a factory at Sh Chicago in the heart of the grain belt. In 1847, by 18 in 1847, by 1860. More than 100,000 reapers were in use on western farms. Almost as important to the grain grower was the thresher, a machine that separated the grain from the wheat stalks. Threshers appeared in large numbers after 1840. Before that, farmers generally flailed grain by hand. Seven bushels a day was a good average for a farm or used farm animals to tread it. 20 bushels a day on the average. A threshing machine such as those manufactured by the Jerome I. Case factory in Racine, Wisconsin could thresh 25 bushels or more in an hour. The Northwest considered itself the most democratic section of the country, but its democracy was based on the defense of economic freedom and the rights of property, a white middle class vision of democracy that was becoming common in many other parts of the country as well. Abraham Lincoln, an Illinois Whig, voiced the economic opinions of many of the people of his section. I take it that it is best for all to leave each man free to acquire property as fast as he can, said Lincoln. Some will get wealthy. I don't believe in a law to prevent a man from getting rich. It would do more harm than good. When one starts poor, as most do in the race of life, free society is such that he knows he can better his conditions. He knows that there is no fixed condition or labor for this whole life. Rural Life, page 294 and 295. Life for farming people was very different from life in towns and cities. It also varied greatly from one farming region to another. In the more densely populated farm areas east of the Appalachians and in the easternmost areas of the Northwest, farmers were usually part of a relatively vibrant communities and made extensive, extensive use of the institutions of those communities the churches, schools, stores, and taverns. As white settlement moved farther west, farmers became more isolated and had to struggle to find any occasion for contact with people outside of their families. Religion drew farm communities together, perhaps more than any other force, particularly since so many farm areas were populated by people of common ethnic and therefore religious backgrounds. 
Town or village churches were popular meeting places, both for services and for social events, most of them dominated by women. Even in the areas with no organized churches, farm families and, again, women in particular gathered in one another's homes for prayer meetings, Bible readings, and other religious activities. Weddings, baptisms, and funerals also brought communities together in celebration or mourning. But religion was only one of many reasons for interaction. Farm people joined together frequently to share tasks that a single family would have difficulty performing on its own. Festive barn raisings were among the most frequent. Women prepared large suppers while the men worked on the barn and the children played. Large numbers of families also gathered together at harvest time to help bring in crops, husk corn or thresh wheat. Women came together to share domestic tasks as well, holding bees in which groups of women joined together to make quilts, quilting bees, baked goods, baking bees, preserves, preservation bees, and other products. But despite the many social gatherings, farm families managed to create, they lived in a world with such much less contact with popular culture and public social life than people who lived in towns and cities. Rural people often, even more than urban ones, treasured their links to the outside world. Letters from relatives and friends in distant places newspapers and magazines from cities that they had never seen, catalogs advertising merchandise that their local stores never had, yet many also valued their separation from urban culture and cherished the relative autonomy that farm life gave them. One reason many rural Americans looked back nostalgically on country life once they moved to the city was that they sensed that in the urban world, they did not have as much control over the patterns of their daily lives as they had once known. <clears throat> Looking back, page 295. Between the 1820s and the 1850s, the American economy experienced the beginning of an industrial revolution, a change so profound that the United States, as in Europe, it transformed almost every area of life in fundamental ways. The American Industrial Revolution was a result of many things. Population growth through both natural increases and immigration, advances in transportation and communication, new technologies that spurred the development of fa factories capable of mass product producing goods, the recruiting of a large industrial labor force and the creation of corporate bodies capable of managing large enterprises. The new economy great, created great wealth, expanding the ranks of the wealthy and helped to create a large new middle class. It also created high levels of inequality, which were particularly visible in the growth of a large industrial working class. Culture in the industrializing areas of the North changed too, and there were important changes in the structure and behavior of the family, in the role of women and in the way people used their leisure time and encountered popular culture. The changes were often alluring, often disorienting, and often both. They helped widen the gap in experience and understanding between the generation of the revolution and the generation of the mid 19th century. They also helped widen the gap between North and South. 